I want to start by asking a question. What would you like to be known for? You know, is it uh, commercial success? Is it some kind of sporting field? What is it that you would you'd love for people to um, know you for? Like the, 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 the thing that describes you, the thing that identifies you, the, the hallmarks of your character. The, it's a good question to, to ask. It's a good question to think about. Um, and this morning I'm going to be talking about um, how Paul shows us something of his life. Um, but importantly, it's only because of who he's connected to. It's because he is in Jesus, because he is in the presence of Jesus, and because of who Jesus is, and the way in which Jesus leads him and empowers him and provides for him and gives him everything that he needs, Paul is who Paul is. And the book of Acts, we've seen it over and over again, is very much the acts of Jesus. It's not the acts of the apostles. I mean, they're involved. And, and, and it's not necessarily or primarily the acts of the Holy Spirit. It's the acts of Jesus through the apostles by the power of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus gives his spirit to them, which empowers them and gives them an ability to walk with him in a way where he is closer than you can ever imagine. And he is with them. And he is the author of Acts. Yes, Luke wrote it. I get that. But he's the author of what happened. He, he's the author of the very things that were recorded. He's the activator of it. He's the accomplisher. He's the one that makes it possible. And he's the one that started it all. So if you think of the commissioning in Matthew 28, I read it this week again. Uh, one of my favorite passages. It talks about the 11 disciples that, that, that went to the mountain that he said that they should meet him on. So they meet on a mountain. And it says, when they saw him, they worshipped him. Though some doubted. Like we're still struggling in our weakness here. Like we see Jesus, we're worshipping him, and some are like, what the heck is going on? This is like post his crucifixion, like he's meant to be dead, and like we, we're still trying to make sense of this. And it says, then Jesus came to them. So they worshipped him from a distance. You know, they, they're up there on the mountain, and they see him, and they just start to worship him. And then he comes to them, and, and he says, all authority in heaven, and all authority on earth. Think of all the authority that there is, that there can be. It's mine. It's been given to me. And he says, therefore, go. So it's like, in my authority, you go. Because I'm commissioning you. You have an authority which is not your own. It's my authority. So you go by my power. You go by my leading. You go by my strengthening. I will keep you. And most of us know the rest of that verse, go make disciples of all nations. So it's not make decisions. Don't get people to just respond to an altar call. It's just like followers of Jesus. We're talking about radical conversion. People going from being enemies of God to children of God. Transformation taking place in people's lives. We're not just looking for like a moment in a church setting where the pastor feels good about himself because he does an altar call or you, you're witnessing to someone and you're just wanting to get them to a point where they're kind of nodding their head. That's not what it's about. He didn't ask to like, go and make decisions. Go and make disciples, followers of Christ. And um, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So immerse them in the fullness of God. And then he says, and surely... I am with you always. See, that's Jesus' way of saying, this is my show. This is my gig. What's going on from now on, this turning point where all of the Bible was come and, t come and see, there's a turning point. Pentecost is coming, and from now on it'll be go and tell. There's a shift happening in Scripture, and I'm behind it all. 
I am the one that will be with you. I am the one that will come alongside you. I am the one that will work through you. I am the one that will keep you. I will be the one that will sustain you. I will activate you. I will prompt you. I will lead you to those who I love and am drawing to myself. And all of my work, like he dignifies us, that it would actually happen through us. In Acts 1, verse 8, we, we, we said it when we started the series, the key verse is one of, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, which means you're not doing this on your own. In fact, you're not doing it. It's the work of the Lord through you, um, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. In the previous commissioning, he said, I will be with you. Surely I will be with you till the ends of the age. Now he says, you'll be my witness to the ends of the earth. And, and when the ends of the age and the ends of the earth converge, that will be the great day where we will hear the trumpet sound. But, but between now and that time, there's a window where God commissions us, where Jesus says, go, you will receive power. You will be my witness. There's going to be this radiating reality, like these concentric circles, which is where the, the whole design of our graphic came from, these concentric circles of, of the advancement of my kingdom, and it will be through you. And then we see him meet Paul, and he has this incredible experience where he, he comes to faith on the Damascus Road. He's walking on the Damascus road, which is actually just a rebellious road because he's going to persecute and to kill Christians. And then he says to Ananias that he must go to this man from Tarsus, whose name is Saul, and pray for him because he's seen a vision. Now he's blind, but he says, Paul's seen a vision. So like for the first time, Paul's physically blind, but spiritually he can see. And, and, and God shows himself to him, and he says, Ananias, this man, Ananias, will come and pray for you. He'll lay hands on you, and you'll receive your sight again. And Paul's charged with the fullness of who God is. He says, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street. <laughs> I love it. He takes Paul from rebellious road to Straight Street. That's what he does. That's what the gospel does. He takes us onto the mountain. He brings us to a level where we can be in his presence. We reach the heights of his righteousness. And we go from being on a rebellious road, our own way, following our own agenda, to straight street, the road of the gospel. I love it. But you see how like, all the commissioning that comes from Jesus is evidence of the fact that this is him. It's his acts. He's with us. And so our living for Jesus flows from our salvation. It flows from the fact that we are in a relationship with him. We are first sons, then we are servants. And I think too often we think of being servants, like we want to serve God and we want to do ministry, but we lose sight of the fact that we are sons and we're actually designed for intimacy. Intimacy first, then ministry. Ministry flows from intimacy if it has to have any sense of lasting value. And it's, um, this is a relational thing. It's not functional. It's not even missional. It's relational. It, it becomes functional. It becomes missional as a result of it being relational. So we are in him and he is with us. And what I want to cover this morning is the fact that because of the provision, presence, and protection of Jesus, Paul could fulfill his ministry with clean hands, a calm heart, and a clear head. That's what he was known for. He had clean hands, a calm heart, and a clear head. I want to be known for that. So we're going to look at three things of Jesus and three things of Paul. The things of Jesus is, and we're continuing with this divine theme. Um, I've been on that now for a couple of weeks as we've worked through Acts. But, but here we start to see his divine provision, his divine presence, and his divine protection. And then as a result, flowing from that, that's why it's represented like that, because it's only because of who Jesus is and only because of what Jesus does that Paul becomes the man that he is. 
And Paul is a man who has clean hands, a calm heart, and a clear head as he fulfills the life that God designed for him. So the setting, um, we're still in the Mediterranean, the second missionary journey of Paul, and he's um, been at Athens, and he's now moving westward to Corinth, an amazing city, and these radiating circles. I mean, if you look at the, the fact that he was at Athens, then he goes to Corinth, then he goes across the agency to um, Ephesus. I mean, these are centers of significance. Like, the strategic flow of Jesus is amazing. Because, I mean, Athens was, was a, um, an intellectual center. Uh, Corinth was a commercial center. Ephesus was a religious center. Albeit imperial worship, it was a religious center. And, and Jesus uses Paul and directs him and leads him. He doesn't know that that's where he's going. He leads him on a daily basis to these places so that the gospel can be preached, and from these centers it can radiate out. I mean, if trade can radiate out from Corinth, then surely the gospel can as well. And, and so Paul is in this place, Corinth, um, which is a difficult place. Um, and uh, it says the following in, in Acts chapter 18, verse 1. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had ordered all Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them. And because he was a tent maker, as they were, he stayed and worked with them. Every Sabbath he reasoned in the synagogue, trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. But when they opposed Paul and became abusive, he shook out his clothes in protest and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent of it. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Then Paul left the synagogue and went next door to the house of um, Titius, Justus, a worshiper of God. Crispus, the synagogue leader, and his entire household believed in the Lord, and many of the Corinthians who heard Paul believed and were baptized. One night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent. For I am with you, and no one is going to attack and harm you. Because I have many people in this city. So Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and a half, teaching them the word of God. While Galileo was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews of Corinth made a, made a united attack on Paul and brought him to the place of judgment. This man, they charged, is persuading the people to worship God in ways contrary to the law. Just as Paul was about to speak, Galileo said to them, if you Jews were making a complaint about some misdemeanor or serious crime, it would be reasonable for me to listen to you. But since it involves questions about words and names and your own law, settle the matter yourselves. I will not be a judge of such things. So he drove them off. Then the crowd with there turned on Sosthenes, the synagogue leader, and beat him in front of the proconsul, and Galileo showed no concern whatever. I mean, I love Scripture. I love to read about what God does, what He did, and that He's the same God today. Man, it puts faith in my heart. And it should put faith in our hearts. To see what actually took place here is unbelievable. So let's delve into it. The first thing that Jesus provides is friendship. He provides friendship and he provides finances. Friendship, we, we, we read of this power couple, Aquila and Priscilla. They're amazing people. They're tent makers, just like he is. So they have the same trade, and they have the same faith. And, and Paul is there on his own. He goes into Corinth, and he's on his own. You ever felt like you're on your own? Yeah? I mean, his mates, Silas and Timothy, have not yet come from Macedonia. He's there on his ace. But you see, God knows what we need, and he's always putting us into community, and he always puts us into a place where we feel like we are part of a team. And, and he, Paul speaks about Aquila and Priscilla as, as his co-workers. So it says in Romans 16, greet Priscilla and Aquila, 
my co-workers in Christ Jesus, they risked their lives for me. It's an amazing thing. That you can be in ministry together and you can have people that will say, I'm so with you, I'll actually risk my life for you. What a provision. That Jesus would actually put people around Paul that, that would allow him to minister in a, in a way where he doesn't feel like he's doing it on his own. Yes, he's with Jesus. But Jesus knows our weakness. He knows our um, inability oftentimes to find that strength that, that would come from him. And, and he says, I'm going to give you that strength, but for the times that you feel like you're on your own, I'm still going to put people around you. Like, I will bolster you. I will embolden you. I will give you people that would risk their lives for you. And, and these tent makers come alongside him, and they play this incredible role. And their level of devotion was largely contributing to the establishment of the church in Corinth. And so he puts these amazing people alongside Paul. But his finances that he gives, it says, when Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching. So here's Paul, and he's saying, okay, I know how to make tents. I know how to work leather. And, and so I'll make tents so that I can earn money. And, and then I'll go to the synagogue on the Sabbath, and I'll preach the gospel. So he understood what it was to be um, working full-time in, in a kind of commercial sense of like I'm, I'm earning my own money so that I can live, and then taking the moments that he had to preach the gospel outside of the times that he was working. And, and then, I mean, we, we read about it in the letter that he writes to the Corinthians. He says, the brothers who came from Macedonia supplied what I needed. So the Macedonians, where he had been, in Thessalonica uh, and in, in Philippi and in Berea, they weren't wealthy people, but they got money together and sent it with Silas and Timothy. And so Paul gets that and says, okay, but how I can do this full time? So he goes from working full time in a, uh, a kind of um, trade to ministering full time. Now he's preaching the gospel every single day. And you see, like Jesus knows exactly what we need. And he provides and he resources us for the very thing that he wants us to do. And there were seasons in Paul's life where he was working full time, full time and then preaching on the Sabbath. And then there's other times where he just preached all the time. But, but for those seasons, Jesus would provide. And so money comes from Macedonia. And you might say, oh, well, it's the Macedonians that gave me the money. No. Who works in their hearts? Who releases that? Like, we, we've covered that. You know, when, when God touches a heart, our hearts are open, but then our hands are open. And, and so we're all about coming alongside people and coming alongside that which furthers the kingdom of God. That's where our, where our money goes. And the Macedonians are like, take this with you. Give it to Paul. I mean, if you can do it once a week, great. But if you can do it every day of the week, go. And this incredible provision from Jesus. So divine provision. And Paul knew what it was to depend daily on Jesus, this divine provision, to lean into that, then divine presence. It says, one night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision, do not be afraid, keep on speaking, do not be silent, for I am with you. Sometimes I, I lose sight of the fact that Paul was just an average guy, <laughs> you know, because he, he was this like super po apostle. It's like almost you, you read that like, and you get like a bit surprised, like, well, well, what happened there? Well, why was Paul struggling? Why, why did he need to hear that from Jesus? He was just a man. It's not like he was walking around with a cake made out of goat hair and a big A on his chest, super apostle. Like he was just a man. He was weak. He, he, um, he had fear. He had feelings. He had difficulty. I mean, when you read, he writes this in, in, in his letter to the Corinthians after he had visited them and, and spent the 18 months there. He says, when I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. I came to you in weakness and great fear and trembling. What a way to describe yourself. I don't know about you, but I don't like to, you know, kind of make it public that I'm struggling with fear and trembling. You know, there's certain times, I always say to my, my kids, confidence, just go with confidence. Even if inside it's like you, you, you just can't imagine like what this is going to mean, like just go with confidence. It's kind of like just fake it, like just go with confidence. 
And I do that because I've done that over the years where I just don't feel like, I just, but like to say, actually, I'm not confident. I'm trembling with great fear. You see the, the vulnerability of Paul when he writes this letter. He says, this was really hard for me. I was trembling. I had great fear. I mean, the question is, why? Why was he so afraid? And evidently afraid to speak because Jesus says, don't stop speaking. Do not be silent. So his fear was pushing to his, um, like, I'm rather going to keep quiet. I'm rather not going to say anything. Which means, in him speaking, that's what caused the things that made him fearful. Because the Corinthians were very arrogant people. And, 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 and they were very independent and there were all these amazing things that made them the amazing nation that they were. But by preaching the gospel, which is a self-denial reality, it's not about you. It's not about what you can do. It's not about your contribution. It's all about what Jesus has done. And, and, and so to hear the gospel, is a, it's a confrontational reality. It confronts you. And, and it, it brings you to a place of humility. And, and, I mean, AJ and I were chatting yesterday about the setting that he finds himself in now. And, and to be among people that don't want to hear anything about religion, anything about the Bible. A, a generation, a young generation coming through that don't even know what the Bible is. You see, we, we lose sight of the fact, like being in South Africa, we can have this freedom to talk about it. But in some ways, I think it's like we're worse off. I feel like we, we should be confronted sometimes because it would push us into being in the presence of God and realizing that that Christian culture that we have in South Africa is not necessarily like that person saved. They're just speaking with because they grew up in a certain way, but they haven't come to a place of repentance. They don't know Jesus as Savior. They were taught from a young age, you're a child of God because you were born in this family. And we went through a couple of things and made it possible for you. And then, well, okay, well, then that's who I am. But, but, but to be in a place where people are so opposed to you, who, who actually want to kill you for the words that are coming out of your mouth, that's where Paul was. And he was so filled with fear, so trembling in this reality, that he brought himself to a place of saying, I'm going to rather keep quiet. And so Jesus appears to him in a vision and says, don't stop. Don't stop speaking. Don't be silent. I am with you. I mean, how many times do we see that in Scripture? Fear not, for I am with you. Jesus would constantly reassure us, reassure his people, reassure his, his um, servants as they walked into spaces that created feelings of fear and trembling. It's like, no, I'm with you, his divine presence. That's something we need to meditate on. There was a British preacher, G. Campbell Morgan, when he was young, he would read the Bible to two elderly ladies. And um, he got to the, the part of Matthew 28, and he reads about the Great Commission and, and how Jesus then says, surely I am with you always. And he closes the Bible and he looks to the two of them and he says, what a wonderful promise. And the one lady looks back at him and says, young man, that's not a promise. It's a fact. You see, sometimes we just have the promises of God, but it's kind of like it's there. But when you live in it, it's real for you. It's a fact. He's with me. And we need to know that Jesus is with us. When he says, I'm with you, I'm with you always. Do you realize how confident that should make us? Not in a, you know, just fake it kind of way. Just be confident. It's like you can actually be confident. It's, there's like a divine confidence that comes because he is with us. And then we see the protection of Jesus. So the, these Jews are wanting to um, kind of make it seem like Paul is bringing a religion that is unlawful. Religio illicita. I think that's Latin. You're not going to know either, so let's go with it. And they were saying, our religion is religio licita. But this man is bringing religio illicita. 
And because he's bringing something that's different to ours, ours is the only one that Rome has said is lawful, which means what he's doing is unlawful. And the proconsul is like, what? It's a load of rubbish. Off you go. You see the divine providence of Jesus over that, that it would be a proconsul in that moment that would have that view, which would actually have significance for the future of the gospel in Corinth. Because all of a sudden, by imperial policy, he's made this very thing that Paul is speaking, lesita. It's legit. It's lawful. So actually, he paved the way. And you see how, I mean, Jesus says to Paul, no one will attack you, attack you and harm you. And then a few verses down, it says, and the Jews came as a united attack against Paul. And you're like, what? And Jesus just say, no one's going to attack and harm you, and now attack. But it's, I mean, Jesus said, no one will attack and harm you. So sometimes Jesus says, no one will attack and harm you, but it doesn't mean that all the circumstances around you is going to change. His promise to Paul is, you will not experience physical harm. Because I have many people in this city that I have set my love on, and I want you to proclaim the gospel that they can hear and respond to me in faith. And so he, he, he kind of just put a, a protection around Paul to say, even with the attacks, like it doesn't matter how many times, it doesn't matter how opposed they are, no physical harm will come to you. And I love in the moment, like, the Jews are like, ah, and then Paul's about to speak. He's about to say something, and then before he can even say it, Galileo steps in and says, uh, okay, I want none of this. It's kind of like Paul in that moment forgot that Jesus said what he said. You know, I mean, it's just the vulnerability of the man. I love that because it allows me to be vulnerable as well. Like, I've just heard Jesus' promise. Now these guys are saying what they're, and I want to uh, say something back. But before I could even say it, Jesus moves in the heart of a proconsul. He says, I want nothing of this. Off you go. Divine protection. Clean hands. So Paul says, your blood be on your own heads. See, Paul had clean hands. He had clean hands in two ways. Vertically and horizontally. So we read in the Psalms, who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. Without clean hands and a pure heart, you may not ascend the mountain of the Lord. So by the atoning work of Jesus, by what Jesus did on the cross, he brings cleansing into our lives. We are um, saved from our sin and the penalty that goes with that sin. Eternal separation from God. And and because Jesus takes our sin upon himself, he takes the judgment that, that goes with that sin. When we put our faith in Jesus, we are cleansed from that reality. It's no longer on our hands. What a glorious truth. And so his hands are clean. And and, and he's gone from rebellious road to straight street. And and like the disciples, you, you may now reach the heights of the righteousness of Christ and stand in his glorious presence, not because of anything that you've done, but because he has made it possible for your hands to be clean. Vertically, my hands are clean. But then there's a reality that we reconcile to Christ and then we're given the ministry of reconciliation. We are commissioned and we are called by God to share the good news with others who don't yet know him. And, and Paul uses language of, your blood is on your hands. Oh, sorry, your head. My hands are clean of this. So you've heard the phrase, you know, your blood is on my hands, or his blood is on your hands. And like that. that image is from Ezekiel 3. It was about the watchman standing on the wall. And he would watch to see if there was any enemy attack. And, and in the event of that, he would warn the people. And if he warned the people and warned them well then their blood, if they did not heed the warning, would be on their heads. They would be responsible for their own choice. But if he, heed, if, if he gave them the warning and they heeded that warning and they responded, then like, he would be able to say, well, I've got no blood on my hands. Because if you're responsible for your choice and I'm responsible for the warning, if I give you the warning, then there's no blood on my hands. But if I don't give you the warning and you experience death, well, then your blood is on my hands. And, and so Paul is saying, my hands are clean 
because I've come to this place of faith. So vertically, before God, my hands are clean. But as I walk and as I move, wherever God sends me, I mean, listen to this verse, um, Acts 20, he says the following. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all. For I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Now, I, I really feel like this, this preach is more for me than anyone else. So I'm, I'm going to state that. And I'm, I'm very sincere in what I'm saying, that in that I have the grace of God and the good news of the gospel. But I feel like I can't say that I've taken every opportunity. I feel like there's times where I have shrunk back. When I have this incredible truth, the whole counsel of God. And Paul says, I have not shrunk back. I have declared to you the truth of the gospel, the grace of God. I've not, I've not taken any moment where I've shrunk back from this. I've declared it to you. My hands are cleaned of your blood. If you heed this warning, well then, great. But if you don't, your blood is on your own heads. But you see, the reason why Paul could do that in the face of adversity was because Jesus was the one saying, I'm with you. Because the moments that I've shrunk back is because I have fear in my own life. And Paul is trembling. He's filled with fear. And yet Jesus would come alongside him and say, I'm assuring you, you can do this. But don't just stop speaking. Don't be silent. I am with you. I will keep you. And in that strength, in that confidence, Paul could declare the whole counsel of God. Not shrink back. Not be silent. So his hands are clean. He had a calm heart. I read this, um, the words of Jesus to him, do not be afraid, keep on speaking, do not be silent, for I'm with you. No one is going to come. I read it, and I timed it, and it was 18 seconds. And then I looked down, it was like a year and a half. 18 seconds of Jesus speaking translates to 18 months of Paul staying and being steady. It was like one line. Jesus just appears to him in a vision. It's not like he appeared to him every night. I really feel like Paul understood what it meant when Jesus said, I'm with you. But he wasn't hearing those words all the time. And, and, and so he heard through a vision, and then other times he would see miracles. Like he would see the evidences, like Jesus is with me. And he was constantly being emboldened by this, where his heart could actually be calm. He could go from being trembling and filled with great fear to, my heart is calm because he's with me. So faith is based on feelings. Sorry, not, not based on feelings. It's based on fact. The fact that Jesus is with us. Faith is not based on circumstantial outworking. It's based on a celestial commissioning. We get so caught up with the temporal consequences. We should be overwhelmed with the eternal inheritances. That comes with this incredible privilege that's been given to us. Paul had a clear head. So Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and a half, teaching them the word of God. Paul stayed and he was steady. He knew the mandate upon his life. He wasn't double-minded. He wasn't sidetracked with his own selfish thoughts or things that would come from the side. He, 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 he knew what he needed to do. So even when he was making tents, it was for the sake of ministering. It was for the sake of proclaiming. It wasn't like, let me make tents because I want to be the best tent maker in the world. It's like, I'll make tents which will allow me to live, which will allow me to proclaim the good news. He was so clear in what he needed to do. And, and his focus it was, it was upward and outward. I think if, if you consider the, the demand that is being placed on psychology, 
and medication. I mean, we, we have a society that is so focused on self. And I'm, I'm not advocating that there's not real problems that people go through. But what I am saying is that when your focus is inward, you get caught up in things that you shouldn't be get, getting caught up with. Our focus should be upward. Who God is and his purpose. It should be outward on God's people. Like your head needs to be clear. Like that's the mandate on my life. I asked myself a question as far as like a desire in my own heart. Do I desire greater effectiveness in my activity? Or do I desire greater tenderness in my dependency? So, my dependency on Jesus and me being tender about that, truthful, I can't do this on my own. Without you, I can do nothing. Your words to me, as I get it from scriptures, remain in me. Without me, you can do nothing. Like, if I really believe that, if I'm really finding a tenderness and a vulnerability in who I am and an inability to do anything that has eternal significance and lasting reality, then I will tenderly come before him and say, I'm so dependent on you. It's my greatest desire is to have a tenderness as far as being dependent on you. But I can tell you that has not always been my greatest desire because I've had desire to have effectiveness in ministry, effectiveness in activity, which in itself is not bad. But when that becomes the focus, when, when I'm looking at that and not realizing that there needs to be a tenderness in my dependency, just like Paul came before Jesus and said, I can do nothing without you. You see, the reality is when we find tenderness in our dependency on him, effectiveness in our activity will flow from there. It's like if you, if you aim at the right thing, you get both. But if you aim at the wrong thing, you get neither. And then we live our lives kind of like, well, we saved, but what is my purpose? And I don't really even think about the lost. And I've got my own stuff to deal with. Come on, man. There's more. There's a call to more. And I want to be a, a watchman whose hands are clean. A worshiper with a calm heart. And a witness with a clear head. My mandate is clear. That's what I want to be known for. What do you want to be known for? Can we find a dependency to be in his presence? And hear me when I say, I'm speaking to myself first. We can come before him and know his presence in our lives. His glorious provision. His glorious protection. He's coming alongside. He's covering us. He's keeping us. He's lifting us. He's reassuring us. But when we're not in his presence, when we don't allow that to be our lives, and, and we just carry on with whatever we're wanting to do, we lose so much. And we can't say our hands are clean. We can't say our heart is calm. We can't say our head's clear. You will only find those realities when you are in him. That's why Jesus said, remain in me. Don't worry about your life. I'll worry about you don't have to worry about that. My, my plans for you is to have a fullness, an abundant life, filled with divine joy. I've got that. We're like, oh, how do I get that if I'm not focused on my own life? No, you get that when you are upward and outward in your focus. He sorts out the rest. Seek first the kingdom of heaven, and all these things will be added unto you. We don't have to worry about that.